So I, I know Jim was here. We'll just wait till he gets back and then we'll uh, get started on this and uh, get going. And I wish we could have done this in person, mind you. We're hoping to, but unfortunately at, uh, you just, you know, staying pretty cautious still, not sure what the new variant's doing. Probably the best way to do this for a short period of time anyway, to help keep everybody safe and until we see the direction that it goes. But uh, today we're actually gonna cover off a fair bit of stuff, but uh, really wanna thank everybody for taking the time. I know we probably you know, had lots of different Zoom meetings over the last little while and it would have, as I say, would have been good to do everything in person and, and really get to see everybody. But the next best thing is get to see your faces and we get to chat and get caught up. And I uh, really want to thank you know, everybody's time here, as well as, you know, we have Alicia that is part of our international team, Vice President of Realty Executives International has joined us. And uh, so it's pretty excited. Thanks, Alicia, for taking the time to be part of this. Well, thank you for having me. And so, uh, you know, first of all, you know, one of the things I want to sort of cover off and make it interactive is we do a lot of business across Ontario, right? So, and I know there's referrals that go back and forth. So I do want to cover off just letting you know what I see in the marketplace and then get feedback from the different areas where you are. And so like right now where our head office is in this song, so just west of Toronto, what we're seeing here is we still on properties that show really well um, and are priced properly. We're still seeing multiple offers. We are um, very shy on listings. They were hoping to see more listings coming out in the, in the fall as we sort of get, you know, people get settled with doing, you know, getting kids back to school, understanding what that's going to look like because there is still lots of talking, you know, throughout on this area about, you know, more listings coming up, but there's still lots of buyers. Uh, in, in Toronto, downtown Toronto, three, four months ago, a little bit of a lull in the, in the condo market, but in the last 35, 60 days, especially in the last 30, the condo market in Toronto has been seeing multiple offers, price appreciation, so there is a demand for people that are starting to come back into Toronto. There is actually a demand where we're seeing investors starting to buy up some of the product in condos in Toronto. So that's a, that's a strong sign. Um, I was down, you know, going down to Toronto for different events and there's definitely a lot more population, a lot more foot traffic. Um, we're seeing new openings of stores, you know, because we did have, you know, several that had closed, um, seeing a lot more new openings and, um, you know, there's, and, and you're getting the events back, you know, we're getting, you know, TIFF was back. So you had the, you know, the international film festivals back, football's back playing, baseball's back playing, hockey is going to be playing, Raptors have been okay to start playing. So you're really, we're seeing a resurgence of downtown also, just to let you know, the other thing that uh, through my connections, talking with different um, ownerships of different companies and corporations, and through my clients, where they've actually been informed that as of November 1st, lots of them are going to be coming back to what they call a hybrid model for work. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be doing two days a week on the first week. Three, day, three days a week the next week. So every other week, they are going to be having people coming back into the office. And yet some of their company organizations, such as anything to do with support for, um, anything to do with your support for any type of services, any type of e-commerce, all of those people have been told they're actually going to be working from home permanently which is interesting. So what the people they're bringing back in are creative, marketing, strategy, um, sales. So, you know, I just thought I'd share that with you. That's, that's what I've been told and that's where the companies and, and different, you know, different things that people are looking at what's going to be happening with Toronto. You know, is Toronto going to be a ghost town? 
Uh, what's going to happen to the people that bought outside of the GTA? Are they going to have to start coming back? Uh, some of them are. Some of them are actually looking at, you know, they've already been called back, but on a hybrid model. So I thought that was kind of interesting to see. Um, one thing that hasn't affected, you know, we haven't seen the influence yet in Toronto is immigration. Immigration has been very minimal. And the anticipation is we're going to see over 400,000 people next year being allowed into the, you know, be allowed in. The majority of those are going to gravitate to Ontario, right? So there's opportunity there for that. Um, as far as the Niagara Falls area, Jim, I know you were asking about what's going on in Niagara Falls. They are still seeing an influx of people from the GTA, but not as crazy as it was six, eight months ago. So, but still there are, um, they're getting a mixture of people that are selling in the GTA, retiring there. They're also getting people that are looking at buying as investments because the rents are still strong and the pricing, even though it's appreciated, there's still, uh, there's still some room in, in return for them for the Niagara Falls area, okay? Now, Jim, your office just sort of north end of Toronto, what do you see? Um, I, uh, I would say condominiums that are priced reasonably well are moving fairly fast. And uh, uh, yet detached housing in our area has sort of reached a $2 million plus threshold and it's stagnating because of the $2 million price. Um, you know, the trading area that I like to trade in, I would say not that long ago was, I thought a million and a half dollars was a lot. And, but we've seen six or seven listings sitting on the market now for 84 to 90 days in the 2.2 range, which were the 1.5 listings at one point. So they've scaled out. And uh, and when a product comes in that's in the million and a half range, it's usually gone right away, like almost overnight with multiples. So, so again, there's so you are seeing some where the appreciation of pricing is affecting some buying power in the consumers. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I'm going to drift off subject a little bit, but I'll let you go back. Even, I mean, Dan's got a place, or Matt's got a place. You asked me about my place up at the lake. Okay, places two years ago were selling for $60,000. I sold on the weekend for one seventy-five. the same place. So never in my lifetime did I think a trailer would appreciate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You don't own the land, for God's sake. So... It's crazy. Anyway, that's that's what's happening in my world. Okay, super. Uh, where's Carl hanging around? All right, Amanda, Carl. You guys are in Sud. You guys are in Sudbury, and all I heard about from you over the last six eight months is where are all these Toronto people coming from? That's right. <laughs> that seems to have slowed down somewhat the Toronto flow, uh, but. All the locals are still like the, they're on the move. What they can, what you can find, uh, we still have an inventory problem in terms of lack of housing, like everywhere else. But in many cases, we're seeing you know nine to fifteen offers on a property. Wow. Okay. And they're selling. Still, yeah. Yeah. Still today, and they're selling fifty, hundred over, no problem which was unheard of, you know, a year ago, we didn't see a hundred thousand over asking, but it's almost commonplace now. If they want it, they just buy it. Yeah. Now are you seeing, I know when we chatted, it was a lot of uh, GTA people trying to do a flip, like buy and, and try and flip it even before closing it. Is the market appreciated to the point where that's not happening? Uh, that's not happening more so because we're not working with them. Most agents, I don't want to take them with, with those clauses, right? right. All these assignment clauses. Okay. Um, so we don't have to deal with them. There's plenty of other cash buyers out there. So if it's got an assignment clause, we try and avoid them. If we can, we recommend that they don't take them versus when we got another one on the table, equally as good. 
you know, doesn't have an assignment clause, then that's what we'll go with. Yeah. Hey, Dan, um, I know that, you know, you're, you're east of Toronto and I know when we chatted, you were having, again, that Toronto influence coming that way. Is it still strong? Yes. Um, we, we've got the, the magic one hour from, from Toronto. Uh, so right. we've, got, we've got the combination of professionals moving down here and when they need to commute in, we've got the via that takes them right downtown Toronto in an hour or 55 minutes. Um, we are seeing, but we have, Clover has always been influenced by Toronto, but we're seeing a balance jumping in from Durham as well. Um, Toronto people tended to jump over Durham and right into Northumberland. Now Toronto is going into Durham and now Durham is moving out, which, which is changing the, uh, the demographics. We're now seeing families move out here where we had a very high influence of uh, retirees and retirees don't spend money. So when we got young families, we're starting to see commercial expansion. We're, we, I think in the last two months, we've had 22 stores open up in Coburg alone. So oh. for, for a, a town of 18,000, uh, that's pretty, pretty substantial. So there is some confidence that way. Uh, and we're, we're two are still seeing multiple offers. Um, on average, I would say it has backed off a bit, but up until I would say 60 days ago, we were seeing between 125, 150 over asking on just about everything. But I'm, we're now seeing realtors, we weren't adjusting our pricing. We were still mark or pricing our the product, what we believe was pro appropriate for our market and letting the consumer decide where, where the gravy was. Um, now we're starting to see the realtors bumping up the pricing, which is reducing the amount of offers. So the multiple offers, we're still getting them, but instead of 20 to 25, we're seeing three to seven, but the, the prices are still coming up to where the expectations uh, of the sellers are, so. Okay, interesting, okay. Yeah. Clarence, you're in Peterborough, which is, you know, an hour and a half or so from Toronto, and now we're from sort of the, you know, the north, northeast part. Um, what's going on in Peterborough? Well, we're pretty much reflection of uh, Dan and, and everybody else. It's always the same. We did have a lot of people coming in and seeing the big ones, but the multiple offer, thank God, as I was starting to wean a bit and stuff and down and where you still see three or four. Our problem is we're so short of listings. We have no product to sell. Yeah. And, um, but uh, they're still out there. And I, I just, just finished one last week there that uh, people from Durham jumped over Coburg Port Hope. He wanted to be down east. So we sold his house for in excess of a million. He bought one for 575 down in Brighton, actually. So there's still some hope down there that prices are reasonable. But anyway, he thought he'd spend 450 and ended up spending five and a quarter. So there's still probably, and there were seven, we were one of seven offers on that. And those people were, uh, they're still, they're, we saw it. And as we, we were looking towards Kingston, we saw more. At, as you got closer to Kingston, you get 13 to 15 offers, whereas there was a law in the area there just north of Brighton and whatnot. And I see Dan shaking his head. Yep. He's there that there was just, it, it just seems to be spreading. And then from Kingston came back. But but shortness of listings is uh, our biggest problem right now. I'm trying to get something to buy. And I think that makes multiple offers in itself, right? Because there's only one product to choose from. Yeah. Just to share something on a side note, when, you know, looking at real estate in, in Ontario, my daughter goes to Queens in Kingston. This is, you know, she's starting her fifth year there. And I can tell you in the last, when, I, when we first went to look at housing for her, I thought, oh, maybe I'll look at buying a place. And, and then I decided, you know what, I don't need to be a long distance landlord, even if she is there. Well, this year, so Two years ago, all of a sudden, there was like all these new foundations being put in. Today, you know, we went back in September, there are five new cranes. They're building eight story uh, design build units that investors can buy and rent out to students where Kingston never had any of that. You know, if you were buying something for, you know, student housing in Kingston, it was 
an old brownstone or, you know, detached kind of house. But now they are, they're knocking down stuff all along Main Street and they're building, you know, six to eight stories and geared one, two, three bedrooms. And that is something that I never thought I'd see in Kingston, but it is, it's booming. So I don't know if, I know, you know, outside the GTA, we have lots of brokers here that have offices in university or college communities. I don't know if you're seeing that yet there, but um, if Kingston's doing it, then, you know, you may start seeing some of that take place in your communities as well. Frank, you know, your brokerage is in the city north of Toronto, I think they are, just above Toronto. What's happening there? Toronto. No, it's, it's the same thing like everybody else. We're right, you know, there's not too much product right now, but there's a lot of new development happening here in Vaughan. The land in front of me actually just sold for $90 million. Uh, Green Park just bought that. They're going to put another 10 billion in front of my office here. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, so a lot of new construction happening around my office and in the Vaughan area in general. But again, lack of product in terms of resale. You know, so. okay. It's been a strong market. It's been a very, very strong market. And uh, yeah, we're, trying, we're, we're all trying to get some inventory, right? We're trying to build that inventory. And yeah. Pretty much over here, same thing like everywhere else. It's just uh, a lot of, the, so a lot of my clients, you know, have sold here in Vaughan and been moving more further north, like Innisfil, Barry. But the average sale price in Barry, you need about a million dollars in Barry. So, yeah, so that's sort of the, the movement that we've been seeing here. A lot of people are kind of shifting and moving further north, you know, selling here in Vaughan and going the other way. So. Yeah. And, and that's been, and that's been very common, right? That's been the trait. That's where, you know, people have been told during COVID, Hey, you're going to be working from home and then you're going to be you know, permanently working from home. So we've been seeing people that, well, I can, you know, Carl and I, I had, I had clients of mine that um, are there. I sold their parents place years ago, but they were a, a young couple working in, in Toronto in a condo no car, so the down, your typical downtown young couple, no car, they wanted to look at places, of, you know, Mississauga, they wanted to look at places in Oakville, which is just west of Toronto, showed them places, and by the time we started looking, the price went from 750, and the places that they were looking at, they took the Christmas off, took December off, by the time we started looking in January, it was up to nine or a million. And fortunately, you know, I said, hey, look, you know, this is what's going on. So well, we just found out that we can, you know, we can work from home anywhere. Do you happen to know somebody in Sudbury? So I called Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Carl ended up selling them a house in Sudbury. So, nice. yeah. So, right. So you just don't know. And that's why it's so important to communicate and keep in touch and, and do this kind of stuff. So we all have a little bit of a handle of what's going on in the marketplaces. And now, Matt, you have offices north, you know, basically around London, Ontario, um, so more northwest of the GTA, and you've got places that are close to London, you've got places in smaller communities. What are you seeing and what have you seen with GTA, GTA influence or what's going on in those areas? Yeah, it's been a major influence. Um, kind of the joke around here is if you got high speed internet, you're going to get any Toronto buyers. Um, we, I'm working with a new subdivision just outside my office, um, and I, retired school teachers who are 45 years old um, are purchasing here thinking they hit the, the jackpot, um, you know, spending five, 550 on a townhome where they're, you know, leaving a million and a half dollar condo, I guess, in Toronto. Uh, um, so it's kind of a quality of life thing. Um, right. Also, we deal a lot with the, the lake, like Lake Huron, Grand Bend, Bayfield, Godrich area, um, tons of traffic on those listings right now, um, anything that's along the lake. Um, somebody told me there was a, a brokerage in Toronto that was that actually named themselves Go West um, Brokerage. So we're seeing, I have some property in the, some personal property in the Bruce County, and, and that's getting some traction there too, but we're really seeing uh, that two hour commute roughly from Pearson International to 
uh, where we are, it's uh, it's not that far of a commute. It's a little nicer than going up north to Muskoka is dealing with, you know, the Highway 400. Um, we're getting a lot of that. I think it kind of seems like in the last couple of years that Toronto's kind of woken up to southwestern Ontario and, you know, the most beautiful sunset in the world in Lake Huron. Um, and it's not only just those lake towns, it's, it's some of the hamlets and the smaller towns that are still 20, 30 minutes away from the lake, which I find kind of interesting because I ask the, these buyers, like, so what's bringing you to this town? And well, you're close to the lake. And when you, when you grow up here, I think 20 minutes is still far away from the lake. We're not a lake town, but it's close enough for a lot of them. Wow. And uh, yeah, a lot of professionals, lawyers, just people, it's often a lifestyle change, as I said. And they're, they're, they're liking the values. Mind you, they are going up just like everywhere else. We have an inventory shortage. Um, first time home buying is a major issue. Um, yeah, it's uh, even finding like a rental house is everything's tough to find, to find something right now. But um, overall, I mean, if you, the, the idea is you get listings and you're, and you're gonna sell. Um, buyers are a lot of work and often lose a lot of times, but uh, you get a good listing and you know what's gone. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that that, uh, and and one of the things we saw during COVID were was where you know you had the people from the GTA looking for waterfront, like they they were looking to buy you know cottage property where they could see themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nelson, you're in uh, Guelph, Cambridge area, Waterloo, not that far out from the GTA. What have you been seeing? Hey, Scott. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, here, I mean, our market has been strong for several years, uh, but this COVID, uh, yeah. the March was sort of the peak we have seen experience this year, and then it is kind of tapered off a little bit. Now it's like a balanced, but still strong seller's market. And uh, if you have a listing, yes, it is. If the property is maintained and priced properly, yeah, it's going to sell in a week. Most of them are still under pricing, holding off offers and doing the bidding, bidding kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, so, and Scott mentioned about the student um, influence and purpose-built student buildings. Yes, we do have them here and also in Waterloo. Uh, some builders are building specifically for students and investors. Yeah. Mike, um, North Bay. Um, hopefully, you're there. I, I see you got your. The um, if you could just give us a little bit of influence on two things. One, the residential side. But I know when we were chatting, you were finding just the number of investors that were gravitating to your area. Yeah, the residential. Just you know, first of all, hi everybody. Um, yeah, residential, same as everybody else. Uh, great deal of lack of inventory. Our prices have gone up. Average price in the year and a half, like 250-ish, up to now four and a quarter to 450. North Bay has always kind of been undervalued, so it's kind of about time because I think Southern Ontario has figured out there are four lanes to North Bay, even though we're not a 400 series. So, uh, you know, a lot of waterfront properties, they don't last past a week. Residential, they don't last past a week. Uh, everybody's doing solid directions up here for about that week period. Still lots of multiple offers on the residential side. Um, income properties, well, Scott, you know, it's uh, uh, cap rates are still pretty good here. Uh, there's a lot of people um, from the south uh, when COVID hit, um, realized that we, we were 8 or 9% cap rate. Now we're, you know, anywhere from six on the really big buildings to upwards of seven and a half or eight for, uh, for retrofitted uh, duplexes and triplexes. So we still have really good uh, cap rates that produce the cash flows. And I think uh, the rest of the world's kind of clued into our cap rates that are still pretty good here. And I've probably got a couple hundred buyers now for, for income property. I'm, I'm only one realtor. It's, it's absolutely crazy up here. All right. So. Yeah, but I'm finding a lot of those investors are looking for the burr effect. Uh, so I have some listings that have been sitting, they have good cap rates, but there's, you know, the rents are maximized and there's no um, secondary uh, refinance opportunity in a year from now to get that other, the burr effect, right? Right. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, Alicia, um, we're going to 
ask if you could just give us, you know, obviously talking with all the different brokers throughout our international system, maybe you can just give us an overview of what you're, what you're hearing, what you're seeing throughout North America. Sure. So the, the shortage of inventory, especially on the, the listing end, um, huge, huge issue all over uh, U.S. and Canada. So I think that's one thing that I'd say has been um, a common concern for probably well over a year at this point. Um, a lot of the pricing, you know, for homes that are listed are much higher um, than I think anyone anticipated they would be. I would especially say that here for the Phoenix area in particular, um, homes that maybe a year and a half ago would have been, let's not call it, you know, 400 to 450 are now well over 600, multiple offers. Um, multiple offers is another big thing, over asking price, a huge thing. I will say though, within the last 60 days, there has been just a slight softening of that where even though there are multiple offers coming in on properties um, and the price is also still often over the asking price, it's not quite as high and there's not quite as many offers on those properties as there was before. So um, what I'm not sure about is whether that's just a, a timing thing at this point with school restarting, um, you know, it could be a lot of different things, especially depending on where you're at in the country. But um, a lot of what you're experiencing is, is happening everywhere in the U.S. too, though I will say it sounds like the pricing in the Toronto area is significantly higher than what we're seeing um, pretty much all over the U.S., like with the exception of a few places, you know, like the major markets that you would expect, like, you know, New York and L.A. and that kind of thing. Right. Okay. Uh, Amanda was asking, and, and you know, if you saw the chat there, she's asking about, you know, new construction, you know, what do you see coming forward? And, and Dan, I saw the number you put out there. That is a fair large number of new units anticipated for the Coburg area. Um, and I can let you know, you know, my family, we deal with different builders and, and things like that. And we, you know, talking and meeting with the different builders, they are, they've been buying land outside the GTA. Um, they started focusing about five to seven years ago with the anticipation that there would be, you know, the pricing in Toronto would grow to where they could start buying land cheap enough to be able to make the numbers work. Um, but there, you know, there, there are, there's a shortage of land right now. And you, any builder, do you have anybody that's got a, you know, even a possibility of a, of a subdivision, the builders are trying to find land. Um, so and there, there's certainly lots going to be coming on board. The time frame of that takes a bit of, you know, the, the, the municipalities, it's taking a long time, unfortunately. But the, the, the appetite from consumers is definitely there. Um, I can tell you in Niagara Falls, you know, there the builders up there are bringing on projects all, you know, well into where we thought we would never see big subdivisions. Big companies are out there, you know, um, and in all aspects, you know, not just a new, you know, not just the smaller uh, condo style. Um, there was a project that was north, just north of Barry in Oro Medante, which is about an hour, yeah, an hour and a half, let's say, from Toronto. They are 200 and 200, but approximately 225 estate lots. Average price, the first lowest price started at 1.3, uh, went up to two and a half. Uh, they sold out in 60 days. So that is, gives you an idea of sort of there's, and I was having a conversation yesterday and with the builder, my brother and I, and they just said, the builder just went, people in Ontario, despite the pandemic that we've gone through, have money they actually have funds money available and are in positions where they can take advantage of the lower interest rates so i just found that interesting coming from a builder who has the traffic through their website on pre-registrations on you know talking with these people so found it very interesting to see that you know and, and i know peterborough has you know new stuff going on i know the, you know, and Matt, I know you actually, Matt, you were doing some new, new construction development and stuff. What were you finding? Yeah. Um, 
I find when, when you mentioned the municipal um, hoops that we have to jump through, that's been the main uh, problem in our area. Some of these municipalities aren't really used to development and fast tracking things. So that's been a major challenge. Um, I'm working with a smaller subdivision. It's, uh, what is it, 120 homes. We just sold out the first phase and we're hoping to get into the second phase, but we're not even putting them out yet because we don't know how long it's gonna take um, for the municipality to approve it. But uh, yeah, tons of interest in from everywhere. Okay. Um, and uh, um, I know you must have a specific reason for that question. What are you seeing in Sudbury and the outskirts? Um, well, my husband's a home builder, so I've been kind of, we've been discussing because he has a subdivision that he's going to be building in, but a lot of people, a lot of the builders here won't even pre-sell because of the cost of materials right now. So that's where we're struggling because you can sell it today, but you don't know what the cost is going to be tomorrow. So a lot of the builders here have stopped pre-selling. And then you see them come to market when they're almost finished and there's competitions on them. Right. Yeah. We, yeah. we had a situation where one of the first homes that we sold as a new home resold after three or four months for a higher price than what we were selling for new. So the resale market, the new home market can't keep up with the resale market. So it's incredibly hard to, to price these things. And when do you put them on the market? Just as Amanda said, yeah. The uh, just to touch on sort of the costing, um, the and that's been Amanda. And that's a very good point because the costing is a big issue. We actually had some of the big builders here that were building condominiums when the pricing per square foot started to really skyrocket at the beginning of this year. Some of them actually slowed down their work and delayed the, the occupancies in lots of these high-rise condos to the point where they pushed them back out far enough that the pricing per square foot has actually started coming down in the GTA to build. So, um, you know, that's interesting to see that the builders, and I'm talking like Mattamy, I'm talking Monarch, I'm talking big, big builders, will deliberately slow down work to be able to push out and get their cost per square foot for the rest of the build back in line. Because it is, you know, it's very hard to, to project where the costs are gonna be for a project for, you know, three, four years out. Um, so that is a very good point, Amanda. So it, uh, and I know with some of the builders here, they've actually started putting in some escalation clauses where they're actually saying, if the, if the cost to build is, is going to be this much higher, they're allowed to elevate the pricing by up to a certain amount. It's been like 3%. Just to share that with you guys. Okay. Well, that, you know, that's, that certainly gives you an idea what's going on in Ontario. Uh, and with Alicia, you know, giving an idea what's going on in international. So something that we've seen moving forward, for the for the you know the rest of this year, the last quarter, I don't see any of that changing. I think we might see some listings come on, um, but there, there's still some buyer demand. I think right now we're we're going to be in a situation for the next 30 days where families are looking at okay, am, am I going back? Do I have to go back to the office? Can I still work from home? So I still think there's going to be some of that that's going to keep some of the buyers and sellers on the sidelines until they get that fixed or rectified to the point where they know definitely what they're going to be doing. But companies aren't going to know that until towards the end of you know, getting into November, December. I believe and what I see for next year, we're going to have a very strong spring market. And I think we're going to see getting back to a little bit more of a normal summer market where we're going to see very strong spring market still very strong market all the way across but i don't believe next summer is going to be as strong as this summer was just on the fact that we're going to be having getting a little bit back to more normalcy and we're going to have buyers that were hesitant you know this year where you know, what is what's going to happen where they're going to get more into a normal buying cycle next year any thoughts on on that anybody got any what you might see happening at the end of this quarter through to next year Alicia, have you got any insight from anybody from international or our partners? 
Yeah, just a little bit on like the buyer hesitancy. Um, one of the things that we are seeing in a lot of areas too, and I'm, I think it's going to extend, just my gut tells me it will extend beyond this year. There are a lot of people who are eager to sell or would be willing to sell their homes that are putting off selling their homes because of the pricing in the market. Being able to buy something that's comparable or like a step up from what they already have is so outpriced compared to what they would want to pay or what they could afford that's keeping a lot of people in place. Um, I I think personally that that's gonna stay the same for the rest of this year and probably well into next year as well. Um, Just because I don't see anyone's, I mean, working from home and different areas, I think that gives people some opportunities to move to different places than where they're at. But I do think that the pricing is gonna make people hesitant to sell their homes and keep that inventory pretty low for quite some time. Okay. Scott? Yeah. One thing that, um, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of Nelson or Clarence, and here we are on Young Street in Thornhill, and every speck and pimple of land on Young Street has got a sign on it saying 500, 600 condos coming. And uh, this isn't just a couple of blocks. This is literally stretching from Steeles Avenue to Richmond Hill. And uh, it would appear there's a really aggressive push on the provincial government to get the Young Street subway through to Richmond Hill because we can see it happening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll give an example. I'm thinking of Clarence. When I go out to Peterborough and I look at 100 acres, oh boy, that would be nice to have 100 acres. But I'm looking on my other screen and there's one project here that is approved by the city of Markham. It's 116 acres and 48,000 residents in one in 116 acres it's it's supposed to be designed as a carless community well well, that's not going to happen it's just not going to happen but if you've got that degree of debt that in fact that community will be the second densest community in canada uh per per square acre so i think you know uh our long term here would be nothing but great because you know, the, like you talked about, four hundred thousand people coming into to the country. Well, young streets where they're all. They, I won't say they're all going, guys, but a lot of them are uh, by the thousands, by the thousands. And the pre-sales, you're right, they go up, and they're, they're closing the offices down in a matter of weeks. So yeah, uh, it, it, and that's where you know, and that's why you know what we're in, we're a very fortunate business. Um, very fortunate to be in real estate through through this pandemic, uh, being a strong market, and then obviously looking forward with just you know the recovery of the economy and just everything that we're going to see here, especially in, in the areas that we're in. And to you know next on what we want to, what I want to touch base on and thank you for everybody's input is making sure that your brokerages are you know compliant because. As of June 1st, FinTrack came out with, you know, different changes and things that you have to implement. And they're giving us until you know, March 31st, 2022 to make sure that those things are being put in play. Um, I have been through two FinTrack audits. I know Clarence has had one. Any of you other brokers had a FinTrack audit? Not here. No? Okay. Um, do you anticipate that as of next summer, you will start seeing FinTrack doing more brokerage inspections? Okay. So part of this is I want to make sure that if you have any questions with regards to, you know, the new implementation of FinTrack that came in June 1st, um, I'm here to help. I've been through it, the inspections. I just want to touch on a couple things just so that you are aware. Um, Some of the changes that came in and hopefully you had the opportunity of going through either Korea or RIA or your local board may have done some uh, presentations for the brokers about the FinTrack, but just want to make sure that you understand that, you know, the things to look at now is we do have to identify and ask buyers if they are a politically exposed person or head of an international corporation. And if they are, there's you know certain things that you have to do just to uh, mitigate any high risk. You also have to check and see if they are 
you know, is it a family member that you're dealing with? Does a family member have a relative that's politically exposed person or, you know, head of an international corporation? Uh, more so for the anybody that's dealing with corporations, you've got to make sure now that the beneficial ownership, which means that you have to determine everybody, if it's a corporation that you're is buying or a corporation is selling, you have to identify anybody that has a 25% ownership. And you have to look at getting company structure and you have to identify those people. As of June 1st, I highly recommend that you understand, you know, when, prior to June 1st, you had, you know, a business relationship was if you did two deals with somebody within the last five years. As of June 1st, everybody should be um, allocated as being a business relationship. All that means is you got to fill out page four of the paperwork, but identify and get new information every time you do a transaction with somebody, okay? Even if you just did a transaction with them two weeks ago, ask and look at and get the new information all the time, put it in the file, it means you're compliant with just the business relationship side. They also introduce the fact that, you know, you could accept, okay, virtual currency as for transactions and for deposits. I highly recommend, and what we've done at our brokerage is we do not accept cash and we do not accept any type of virtual currency. Okay, and I know for the smaller communities, because um, like our office in Niagara Falls, somebody rents a place or someone's buying it, they'll show up with a thousand dollars cash and say, you know, here's the deposit. We say, nope, sorry, you gotta go to the bank. Yeah, we don't we don't take any cash at all. So just uh, make Mike. yep. Um, had a, a large investor person of mine ask about uh, a selling property or whatnot with uh, with uh, Bitcoin or virtual currency. We contact we had our lawyer uh, contact the law society, and uh, it was not accepted okay. through the, even through the law society right now as a transfer of property. And that was just a couple months ago. So just to thank you, yeah, that's good because. Yeah. You know, we are, you know, they, we are hearing, you know, there are some countries that are starting to allow for um, virtual currency, right? So, but um, in your policies, procedures, if you just simply say, we do not accept cash, we do not accept any type of virtual currency, cryptocurrency in any way, that's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Okay. Um, one of the other things to look for is on receipt of funds. Prior to June 1st, um, you know, it was, hey, we got to, you know, somebody give us bank drafts. You know, that's really secure because it's coming directly from the bank. And, you know, our policy was, we, as long as we had the bank draft, the numbers, the bank it came from, that was fine. Um, as of June 1st, anybody giving you any type of deposit, the FinTrack people are looking at that as being, having an effect of an activity on an account. So if someone brings you a bank draft, you actually need to find out where the bank, who, who the bank draft came from and the account number that got affected. Okay, that has to be recorded. Uh, I know that there is some pushback from some buyers who, want, who don't want to give up that information because they're saying, well, I gave you a bank draft. Well, except the bank draft is drawn on either you know, CIBC, whatever institution it is, but it doesn't actually say where the money came from. You could, you know, you could backtrack it and say, yes, it came from this bank and then that bank can find it. But now as of June 1st, FinTrack, and if you look at the actual uh, receipt of funds paperwork, it actually has a spot now where it says which account was affected, who's the name holder of that account, what's the account number. And if you're doing, if you allow EFTs in your, in your brokerage, make sure that you get a copy of the EFT receipt because the EFT will receipt will show you which account it came from and which account it went into. Um, in our area, we're finding now that even attached to the listings 
as, as, an, as an attachment to the listings. There's the, the actual EFT or deposit form straight from the listing brokerage. I don't know if anybody else is seeing that, but in the GTA, that is very, very common. Um, so we're finding that the, the, the information is right there. You as the brokerage, you want to make sure if, they're, if your buyers are doing EFT direct, need a copy of the actual receipt and that needs to go to you because that shows which account was affected, the account number and which, where it went into. Okay. Um, those are really the highlights. There's lots of little changes in the forms, um, but I am available as I, you know, with, with Sam, Sam and I, um, you know, have been really diving into making sure we we're going through everything. Uh, if you do get inspected, you, are, you need to show your risk assessment. You need to be doing a risk assessment every two years, okay? If you need help with that, I can, I can send you mine, you know, basically let you, let you see what I did. So you need to make sure you got your risk assessment. You need to make sure you've got a FinTrack policy and procedure manual, and you need to make sure you have a company policy and procedure manual, and you need a, what this call is a FinTrack regime document which is available through Korea. Any comments, questions, anybody already implementing these changes? Okay, really, really important that, you know, this, this is going to be with, as I say, starting next year, you're going to see FinTrack is gonna really increase. And I've been hearing that they're hiring a lot more investigators, they're going to start really increasing their audits. Okay. Uh, Clarence was kind enough to be the first guinea pig with realty executives. So when I, when I got mine, I called him and, and they came and did mine. And then they did a follow up about six months later, nothing was found, but they did a follow up six months later and asked us to send them the last 50 transactions that we did. So, uh, so they're pretty, pretty secure, pretty thorough on it. But I did want to highlight that because that's very, very important that uh, you keep compliant, obviously, with RICO, which I know all of you do. But FinTrack has just added some new stuff. And if you have any questions whatsoever, Sam and I are here to help you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen because we have franchise training coming up October 5th to the 7th. Let me just load in that for everybody. And then we will uh, get talking about it. And Alicia can actually really talk about it because this is her baby. Yes. So number one, um, I would encourage everyone to register no matter what, even if you've gone through franchise training before. Uh, we actually decided to do it virtually again this year, which um, you know, I wasn't super happy about at first, but now I think it's kind of our, our only option, um, at least for this year. So hopefully back to uh, in-person stuff starts in 2022. But um, so it's the fifth through the seventh. We already have the schedule out that shows you the breakdown of what, um, what each session is about, how long it will last, when it starts and end. It's all listed on this form in Pacific time. Um, but one thing that people always ask, uh, so number one, if you register one time, you have access to all of the, all of the meetings. If you have something going on and you can't go to every session, don't stress about it because I will send the recordings of every single session to everyone. I just have to go in and break them down after we do the recording each day. So it takes a little time to convert them, but you'll have access to all of them to watch them at any time. So if you can't make one session, um, don't worry about it. Just make sure that you can attend the ones that uh, number one you're interested in or, or the ones that um, you're available for. It's free to everyone in the network. The only thing that I ask is that you don't invite any of your executives. Um, this is a great opportunity for brokers, owners, uh, recruiters, admins who want to learn a little bit more about everything that Realty Executives has to offer. Um, but it's really not appropriate for agents just because some of the things that we discuss during this meeting, um, it doesn't really apply to the agents. So, you know, we'll do like a marketing overview, a technology overview. We spend a lot of time on recruiting and competitive intelligence. But some of the stuff, particularly the things that you'll see on Wednesday, which is the second day, you know, we're going over brokerage accounting best practices, um, talking about insurance and legal considerations, things that really the, the execs just don't need to worry about. So 
Um, I do ask that you don't share the link with them to register, but anyone in your office who you think would, um, you know, that you would want to see this kind of content, um, please don't hesitate to have them register because the more the merrier on this. It's a Zoom call, so it's meant to be really interactive and engaging. And I think personally, the best part about doing this virtually and like the presentations as they are, you know, we go through, we do have presentations, but after the presentation, we spend a good amount of time talking about the topics too. And so not only are you learning from the content that we've put together, but you're also getting to learn from your peers in the network who have their own unique insights on each of these items, um, you know, in various ways, you know, we have brokerages of all shapes, sizes, and from all locations. Um, so you get a lot of different viewpoints on some of these topics. Yeah, it's a, it's a great event. Um, and it's really important that, you know, even, even being an existing broker, you know, International does a wonderful job in, in introducing and implementing a whole bunch of new stuff. And this is a great way to really, you know, see what's there. Um, and the part that, you know, really is, I really like is all the interaction and even just, you know, I just threw up the, the agenda here, but you get right into, you know, what kind of agent pricing plans are people doing? You know, yeah. what is the competitive intelligence in, you know, compared to, you know, what's it, what are your competitors doing? And getting into right into, you know, recruiting discussions. So all the way through, you know, it's a great few days. Um, so I really do encourage, you know, to you to participate. And uh, especially, you know, I'm going to suggest that Amanda, which is super glad to see you on here, that this would be a great event for you as well. And uh, I'm, I've signed up for it. I, I love going through it. I always learn something. So I do encourage either yourself or if you've got a you know, recruiting person, a manager, anything, in that, anybody in that position, I think it would be a, a real advantageous thing for you. Yeah. And I just popped the registration link into the chat for anyone who doesn't have it. Um, you can sign up that way. But yeah, anyone that you want to send to training, please do so. We don't have limitations on how many people attend or anything like that. Um, but I will say, you know, throughout the year, because some stuff is always changing, it's hard when you guys are busy, you, you know, keeping up with everything in Prime Agent and everything at Realty Executives, it's hard to do. And so this is a really nice like, review and catch up. So even if you just want like three days to try to get as much info as you can to bring you up to speed on you know, what we have, what's available, what people are doing. This really is the best way to do that because you have everyone focusing just for those three days um, and then, you know, moving forward. So um, I would strongly recommend that, it, that everyone attends if you can. Yeah. Now, Alicia, I do not have a slide or information except the fact that um, this year our annual convention is still going to be virtual. Um, last year we did the unconventional convention, which was super great speakers, great interaction. This year it is November 17th to the 19th. Yeah. Uh, maybe Alicia, you could just elaborate a little bit more. I know there's going to be information coming up of that, mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. So it's basically consider this unconventional 2.0. Um, it'll be November 17th through 19th in the same setup as we did the previous year. So we'll have a couple of presentations in the morning block. We have a good break during, you know, middle of the day so people can do what they need to do for business. And then we'll have presentations, two presentations in the afternoon. So um, again, we're trying, we have loaded up the schedule with speakers that aren't necessarily like real estate trainers. We're, we have people from all different industries that are talking about things that really pertain to real estate, um, even though it may not be directly about, um, you know, a real estate business. So for example, um, we have a couple of names that you may have heard of. So there's Phil Jones. Um, this is a, a trainer, a speaker. He actually trains in all different industries. He's the author of the book, Exactly What to Say. Um, so he's going to be one of our presenters. Um, we have people from the hospitality industry. I have um, someone coming to speak about culture who's, who is from Zappos. Um, so a lot of different um, interesting companies that we have speakers from, different topics. Um, emotional intelligence is another segment that we have going on. So I think the, the agents are, are going to enjoy this. Um, it's free to everyone in the network. It's appropriate for everyone in the network. So um, I would love if you would help us um, to get your executives to register as soon as I have the registration link available. I'm in the, I would say in the next week or two, I will be saving, sending out a save the date just so everyone in the network knows that it's November 17th through 19th. I'm just finalizing a few details um, with a recording studio to be able to send that registration link to everyone. But 
um, free. We want to get as many people in there as possible. I think last year we had about 2,500 people register for that event. So I would love to see that over 3,000. Um, that would be a great way to get everyone together and, um, you know, sharing ideas, checking out different content. And of course, you know, register once you have access to everything and I'll provide recordings for everything too. Super. Okay. Um, now, one of the other things that has been put out is the, you know, certified luxury marketing that uh, Realty Executives introduced. And the, one of the things that we're finding is that we're, we're trying to get more of a, more people involved, more executives involved with this. And maybe again, Alicia, if you could sort of just, you know, give us an overview of you know, I have some of my some of my realtors here have gone through the training and actually have got the certification of it and are using some of the products. Where we are having some difficulty is understanding what the parameters are for an executive to be able to use this Realty Executives collection. And, and for those of you that may not be aware, Realty Executives does have this luxury executives connect collection that is a little bit different marketing material than just the, the regular stuff. Yeah. Right, Alicia? Yeah. So to help explain it to you, I just want to provide a little bit of background on like where this comes from and how this uh, realty ex executives collection came about. Um, because for those who have been in the network for a long time, like way back in the day, more so before I was at realty executives, um, there was a like a luxury line that they called Realty Execu Executives Luxury Estates. Um, and what happened with that is there was like, you know, special signage for luxury estates. There was a logo for luxury estates, but there was no limitations on who could use it and where, where they could use it. And so we had a couple of things happening. Uh, number one, we'd have executives who would, um, you know, attempt to jump into luxury real estate without knowing anything about luxury real estate, no experience, no training. Uh, which is kind of a disadvantage, especially for those that are marketing themselves as a luxury agent with realty executives. Um, but number two, it created um, a lot of muddiness for us on the branding side, because we did have some people that would go and they'd say, well, I like that yard sign better than the realty executives yard sign, you know, with our um, standard logo and everything like that. Or I like, you know, the look of this, um, I like the look of this logo and signage, but I'm going to go put it on a property that's $50,000. Um, so there was really no, uh, parameters, you know, or a way to kind of like control how people use the luxury collection, which ultimately like diminishes the power of it because if people are using it on non-luxury properties and things like that, it, you know, then essentially we're just creating multiple looks for the brand and it gets very confusing for consumers. So when we redid this program, we wanted to put in some structure to it that really kind of locked down the program. So only true luxury agents were using the signage and the logos and they were only using them on luxury properties. Um, and that's where this brochure comes in. But basically we established a partnership with the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing, serves the US and Canada. And what we're asking people to do is to join the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing. And to join the Institute, you have to take an initial training course. And so this could be something that is a live event, which they've paused for a while, but I think they're starting to get back into the live events. You can do a live event. You can do the training online at your own pace. Um, I believe they say it's about eight hours worth of training. And then for those people who are actually already selling luxury and they can prove that they've had multiple luxury deals like within the last 24 months, there's a fast track training that they can also complete. And that's only about four hours, um, which gives them membership to the Institute. As soon as they become members of the Institute by completing that initial training, um, they're going to get access to the uh, Realty Executives Collection logos, and they're also going to have a link to order the signage, uh, which we have the signage through Oakley. And basically, every time something is ordered, we're Oakley and, and Realty Executives, we're going through a list of members of the Institute and making sure that they're approved and that they've completed the training they need to to be able to use the signage. Um, and so in that sense, like, I know that that's, that can be frustrating from some agents because they're like, why is this locked down? Why can't I just get the sign? Um, and that's why we want to make sure that they complete the training and not just, you know, grab the logo or grab the signage and say, hey, I'm going to go use this. Um, the last ask on all of this is that when the agents are using the signage and the logos, we would like them to use them on properties that 
the Institute considers a luxury property. So on the Institute's website, there's actually a link that talks about the luxury threshold. And it does it based on um, a geographic area. And honestly, the thresholds are much lower than what I would expect because it's looking at like an average price. So for example, like in, here in Arizona, it's not looking at luxury in Paradise Valley or Scottsdale, it's actually looking at all of Maricopa County. Um, and so the, the luxury threshold is a little bit lower than probably what you would expect in certain areas. But um, those are kind of the two things, like join the Institute, make sure that you're trained as a luxury agent, then you have access to the collateral. And then number two, make sure you're only using it on luxury properties as defined by the Institute. Um, but any you know, members who are already have already done the training, maybe just need to reactivate their membership with the Institute, that's fine. They don't have to take it over again, but we do wanna make sure that they go in and they're getting the education along with the assets. Okay, so it, there is a fee attached to this, Alicia, for members? There is. So if they have not been members before and they need to go through and take the training, it will depend on whether they're doing like a live training or whether they're doing the online one. I'll pull up the Institute and let you know what that amount is because it might have changed a little bit. But um, if they have already completed the training and they're just not an active member with the Institute, they can reactivate their membership for $250 a year. And it's USD. So then in a, in a community, I know like the agents that in my office that work in downtown Toronto or work in you know, real high end luxury, they have gone ahead and done this, but for a community, maybe like Sudbury or for the outer GTA areas, is there a different threshold? There is. Okay. Um, so there is a link here and I'm going to find the, there's basically it's a luxury threshold lookup. Um, and they have a map, an interactive map here, and I'm going to just pop it into the chat. Okay. Um, but you can actually go into the different areas um, and like zoom in and kind of see what the threshold will be for certain areas. Okay, good. Just put that in there. Okay. Um, and that's super, you know, that, that's so, those, those, are, those are two, you know, really uh, interesting things with the luxury marketing. And then obviously the franchise training that you know we're going to get some really good ideas and, and sort of a little bit of differentiation between you know other companies for instance um and what and speaking of you know one of the things we have to look at is what do we do as a company as brokers understanding that you know we are running a company we are running a business we want to be we need to be recruiting because recruiting is what brings agents to our business, which starts putting money at the bottom line. Um, and Realty Executives International has actually put together, I reviewed this, and it is, it's, it's really right on track for you know, us as brokers need to be looking at what is our unique selling proposition, right? So what is it that makes us different than our competitors. And so what they have put together, and this is something that I'm going to really encourage all the brokers to do, because my commitment through this is I want to, I would like to go through this individually with each broker, come see you go through, you know, how you're doing your, you know, your recruiting strategy, your retention strategies, and really use this platform that they, they've introduced here to really focus in on, you know, what is your unique selling proposition? And it's going to be different for each broker in our system, um, but there's going to be some cross crossovers. So I do want to sort of go through this with you and, and it is open discussion. So if you have any comments, any questions, uh, Alicia was very instrumental in her team putting this together. And so I've gone through it and it's right on track. Um, and so this whole brochure is really talking about, you know, looking at what is going to make you different. Okay. How are you going to communicate your message? How do you determine what is, you know, your, your uniqueness? And actually in here, they give you some, some comments, some, you know, uh, some responses that you could use. Okay. And, and Alicia, jump in any time, because I know you probably presented this many times before, um, okay? But again, it's, it's a whole idea of, you know, creating what is your mission and purpose, and, and it's gonna be a little bit different for, for all the different brokerages, okay? Um, 
And the whole idea behind this is, you know, what services do the brokers offer? How do you, know, how do you deliver those services? Why do you even, you know, why are you even doing this? You know, why, you know, what's the purpose and everything that you're doing here? And how does this all tie together so that you can be, you know, relay that and be able to attract realtors to your brokerage, right? And relay that to your existing brokers, okay? Um, again, looking at, you know, this would be sort of a, a, an example of, you know, what is your purpose, the reason for your brokerage, okay? For example, you know, we believe agents are entrepreneurs and should be our sole customer. We provide excellent support to agents so they can focus on servicing their buyers and sellers and growing their business. So definitely a statement that all of us could use, but you may want to tweak it to make it your own, right? You may want to come up with, you know, what do you do to show the people your purpose? Um, and again, this would be where, you know, how do you provide your support? You know, how is that delivered? Um, you know, do you have special pricing plans? So this gives you an idea on, you know, what sort of an example is of where you could fill in the blanks. Yeah, the nice thing about this too, and um, Scott, I think you're going to probably pretty, like you're going to get to a slide that talks about this, but the cool thing about this workbook, it, it's kind of already 80% done for you, to be honest with you, because what we did is we surveyed the entire network. And I will tell you that we've got hundreds of results that I hand sorted and read every single one of them. So it's not something that we said, oh, hey, this is what you should say, because this is what we think is important about your brokerage. This is what all of the executives are saying about what's important about your of your brokerage, about, important about your brokerages, why they join, why they stay, what they like about it, the best parts. And so I would really be surprised, like, you know, if you were to survey just your own executives, I would be really surprised if these results on here didn't match up with what they're saying. And so in that sense, like there's some things that are going to be unique about your brokerage that don't exist everywhere in the network. But I do think that these topics are most likely going to be the things that you want to talk about. And then you're just kind of adding in those extra details to make your selling proposition unique. Yeah, so right like in this, this is so thorough, like they even gave, gave answers, right? So very, you know, very interesting through the surveys they did. Um, very interesting to see through the surveys on what the actual top three or four were, which were probably different than some of the brokerages believe they were going to be. Um, and so you get right into where you can put in and we will build these out together, but give you an idea of some of the, you know, responses from, you know, people that were part of the survey. And then based on the survey, here are the type of responses that you can give. And then build out your unique selling proposition is really what this is designed for. Okay, right down to brand recognition, right down to, you know, right down to everything. Samples, here's what, you know, here's the answers. Here's what, you know, the survey showed. And then we will go through for all the different topics and go through them. And then the whole idea is that we will then together, I'll come see you, then we go through it all, and we really gear it towards your particular brokerage, and I see how I can help you attain what you're trying to attain mm -hmm. through doing this. Okay, and I'm going to send this out to everybody after this call, so you will have it, but the you know, right down to your elevator pitch, you know, right down to, you know, here's some samples. And so the whole idea behind this is really to build it out and to help you get into position where you can use the systems and tools and internationals come out with, you know, the recruiting, different recruiting things built right into prime agent that we can use as brokers to really focus on being involved with you, helping you build the business the way you want to build it. Okay, uh, and right down to, we did, like we were part of, you know, there were some regional developers that were part of doing some, you know, how, espionage, let's call it, checking into uh, 
what our competitors are doing and and we really got in depth so there is some you know there's canadian content there's information on royal page there's information on sutton group there's information on exit um and so we have some of that intel that we'll, uh, we'll be sharing with you as well and also as you come across you know as you check out those cards and you say hey there's some people you know there's some companies in my area that you want cards for we are 100 percent open and willing to make more competitor cards um we obviously can do our own research we can talk to people and kind of put stuff together so if you do see some that are missing that would be helpful for you to have just let us know and we can work on putting those together for you. Thoughts, uh, comments on how this team of interest to brokers see this as being uh, an advantage. I think my, my position is I wanna help you get to wherever it is you wanna get to. And I think this format um, and, the, and the systems that are in, built into this can really help focus us working together to get you there. So, um, so I know if I send it out and I don't get anything back, then I'm going to have to make some, you know, surprise phone calls or surprise drop-ins and go, "Hey, where's this for?" Uh, thoughts? Don't everybody put your hand up at once. It's okay to be scared and say, "Scott, I'm not interested," but I'm going to help you be interested. <laughs> so. And, um, but I just think it's something as a business owner, you need to go through, mm. you know, for us to help you international and myself to help you, we need to know where you're at, where you see your company so we can help put things together to drive that forward for, with you. And don't worry about wordsmithing it either. You know, really thinking about the concepts, thinking about the differentiators, that's key. We can wordsmith it for you. You know that's what marketing teams are for. You know it's, it's kind of their sole job. So don't stress out over that. Um, you know as long as you're coming up with some content when it comes to actually perfecting it, um, we can certainly assist. So it's this should be a low stress um, activity, but one that once you do it once, you can apply it everywhere and keep using it for a very long time. Um, you know minimal updates would be needed in the future. Sorry, Scott, I missed it. But where do we find this? I'm going to send it to you. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'll send it out to everybody. I uh, just wanted to sort of give an overview of it. And then obviously, it's, you know, individually go through it. And then I am, you know, I'm, I'm on the road, I'm back on the road. So Porter uh, started flying again, so I can get to some of those northern places, Ontario faster than driving. So um, but yeah, this is definitely something that I think would be advantageous for us, you know, helping you move forward and, and seeing where you're at with your organization and see where you would like to take it and what your uniqueness is and how we can help you promote that. Okay. And on that particular note, something different, something trying to help. Um, back in November, I was sort of sitting around trying to figure out, okay, what, you know, what can I figure out that's going to help attract um, realtors to our brokerages. And one of the things that you really just, I was, you know, I was getting kept hitting the head and I heard from you people saying, you know, we have all these, you know, we have this great training. Nobody knows about this great training we have, or every company says they have training. So what makes us different? Well, in November, I was sitting around, I was talking with my wife, Nadine, and I'm going, you know, the one thing that really drives me nuts and that I've seen in this industry is that there seems, there, and there has been for a while, a lack of accountability. So lack of accountability for where agents are looking at, they're always looking, okay, you're hearing, okay, well, we want the cheapest price. Uh, what are you gonna do for training? What are you gonna do for leads? Um, so I, I thought I'm going to create something that I remember when I got into business, it was accountable. You had to be in the office at a certain time. You had to, your, your lunch break was at a certain time. You had to make so many calls. You had to do so much prospecting. You had reviews every week on the activities. And I know that we try to do that with, you know, some of the agents we recruit and we present that and, and most of the time the agents are well you know i you know i got into this business because i want to be independent um probably the worst word they could use in a business that you really need to be accountable 
you know, there, yes, there, there are some realtors that come in and they're very, very accountable to themselves. So early, late November, early December, I decided, I looked and investigated all different aspects of what companies were trying to do to attract new people or people that were struggling. And I kept, you know, I see the words mentorship. I see the words, you know, um, things like that. I decided to put together a program I'm, I called Realty Executives Apprenticeship Program. And so in what my format for that was, I wanted to find a way of attracting either agents that have been in the business six months to 18 months or just under two years that had gone somewhere else and were struggling or finding that it wasn't working for them. The training that they got in mass rooms or you know online or just wasn't giving them the guidance that they needed to really do a career in real estate. And then I looked at, okay, in Ontario, we were switching over to the new um, Humber College was then becoming the new instructor for licensing. And they had changed the format a fair bit to the point where the realtors that were going through the new format were actually coming out with more knowledge than just how not to get sued, right? So any of the new realtors were coming through the program, especially through Humber College, were coming out with more of an understanding, more of a business sense. Um, there were extra courses that they had to do that were really geared directly at being a realtor. So I looked at and saying, okay, what can we do to do this? So I created this apprenticeship program. And the apprenticeship program, really how I have decided that it would be the best way to do it was at least I was going to do it as a pilot project before I introduced it or gave you the option of saying, you know, this might be something that you could look at doing. So with my apprenticeship program, it was really geared for me I certainly couldn't do because I have too many hats and just for me to try to do that, I designed it in such a way that it is being a realtor, it's an apprenticeship, it's a one-year program, you have accountability, I will take on the expenses of things for you, but you are going to be accountable to the point where you have to be in daily sessions, you have to be reporting on activities, you are going to get full support throughout the whole year, right down to appointments, right down to uh, anything to do with being a realtor. And so I actually looked at uh, hiring somebody to be that position, at least in my organization, so that they would be the person that would be focused on doing this. I created a compensation program for that particular person. Um, part of at least what I've done, part of it is a, uh, an, and a monthly salary as well as bonus from commissions earned from salespeople. Now I've structured it that way because I'm trying, I'm in an area that I'm trying to build this bigger and I wanted to make sure that it had the right attention to it. And actually, Bunny, who is on the call with us, um, Bunny is a realtor that came to my company from another top team in the GTA. Uh, her background is she has been worked on, you know, good realtor, worked on many different teams, been an instructor, actually went through the Ontario Humber College courses as well. Um, so, Bunny is my director of executive development for this apprenticeship program. And I'm basically going to, Bunny, if you just unmute yourself and just talk about the program before I bring up the actual slides on just what, you know, how it's sort of been received. Sure. Okay. Um, so from the agents that have come in, the new agents that we have that have come in, uh, it's been received extremely well. Um, I do have a variety of agents who just got their license. So brand new, never been with a brokerage, don't know anything about it. Um, they're loving it. 
And then I also have agents who have been in the industry and struggled, like Scott was saying. Um, and they're loving it as well because they're getting the, the training and the knowledge, the guidance. Um, and, you know, this industry can be a, a scary thing, especially if you're starting out new and you don't know what you're doing. Um, and I help them. I always say to them, I got you. Well, I'll be in here with you every step of the way. So um, I'm, it's not unusual for me to get calls evenings, weekends, whenever that they're working on a deal and look, this is what happened. What do I do now? So um, yeah, I mean, it's just um, the response has been very good. So very happy with uh, how everybody is enjoying it. Yeah. So for, you know, obviously for certain brokerage sizes you may not be in a position to have somebody who's dedicated, you know, to do that. But the way I've sort of done the structuring of it is the, the, if you had a mentor, you know, mentor agent or what we actually class, you know, in, in the marketing that we did is that they would be assigned to one experienced realtor and that realtor would be, you know, responsible for doing this type of support. Um, and it actually has been pretty receptive. Now, the one of the things that we were trying to figure out is how do we attract these people? How do we get the opportunity? And understand this program is not geared to just hiring brand new people. They go through a interview process with Bunny. They then go through an interview process with me. And it's all about we want full-time people, we want dedicated, we want people that are understanding accountability. Um, so out of you know all the different people we interviewed so far, we have six or six, six, that, have, six. that are in the program. Our target for the first year was five to go through the program with an annual next year, we're looking at putting 10 through the program. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and what I'm going to go through with is how we use the social media, thanks to Jake, um, who is our, you know, is the gentleman that we use for social media stuff. And we came up with Facebook and Instagram ads that then they would fill out. And then that took them to a link that took them to Bunny would get the information she would then connect with them do a presentation the next process was interview um, so i'm just going to share that with you and we'll go through that because i think this in in some format in your brokerages you should be able to use this to attract recruits and i will say while you're doing that scott that yeah. one of the things that i kept hearing when i was doing my recruiting or even with the agents i have now is there's no other brokerages that are doing this. So it makes us that much more attractive because um, as there are other brokerages that may be doing some training sessions, but not to the degree of the, on the hands-on um, uh, side of things. Yeah, the, and it's interesting because the word apprentice seems to be, you know, there's lots of people talking about, oh, we have a mentorship program. We have a training program. The word apprentice and, and the reason we want to use apprentice is it's a commitment. You know, an apprentice is going in to get trained, but there's a, a commitment level there. Um, so, you know, this this will be the overview of what and how we attracted them. And then the process we went through, what we offered them and give you an idea. So we started with this as one of our ads. And in the initial aspect of it, we were looking at brand new, and then we were looking at somebody who was currently licensed, who would be interested in the apprenticeship program. So this is a sample of one of the ads that we, would, we ran, and it really just talks about, learn about our apprenticeship program. Um, we took the stats from our international, uh, you know, obviously what we do internationally and how that compares to the standard. This is another of the ads that we ran. And then when they, when the, as they went through, they would just put in their contact information. And this will give you an idea when we ran it from March to the end of May, 
on Facebook, we had 185 leads. And in that period of time, we spent $1,318. And those leads were all, I mean, if you refer to sort of like our real estate leads, um, these leads were good leads. I mean, I had conversations with 90% of those leads. Yeah. And, and so. some of the leads had not even taken, were not even in the course. Not even in the course. Yeah. So yeah. we screened those out, looked for people that were in the course yeah. and, and then, or ones that were, yes, I have my license. Yeah. Um, and then the ones that were not in a course yet, we are just putting them sort of in a program that just drip program, you know, talking about, you know, through realty executives. So, you know, a year and a half from now or a year from now, they've got information from us about being a realtor when they get closer to being finished. So our target for doing interviews and trying to get people in was really geared at somebody who's already in the course or somebody that already had a license. Um, just gives you an idea of the reach that we did with that amount spent, how many ads, how many results we got directly from Facebook, from Instagram, you know, how many we reached, how much we spent. So obviously Facebook was way better in the sense of results, but Instagram did give us a presence. Uh, this was interesting to see sort of the demographics of who were responding. And we've actually hired from pretty well the first Almost four. every one of them. Yeah, probably <laughs> the first four. A uh, couple definitely in this category right here, the 18 to 24, uh, which was interesting to see, you know, sort of in this category here in the 20s, it was, um, people that we were interviewing, you know, coming from, you know, education and, you know, looking at or had family members that had, you know, interest in real estate in the background or had some kind of influence. And I will say to that group, the first two groups there, um, those ones are, they are really good to capture those ones because they really are keen. They, you know, they typically, they don't have kids yet or they don't have other responsibilities this is what they're focusing on um because the my two that are in that age group they are they are total go-getters and they're there and they're ready to learn they're like sponges they just want to take it all in so and so then once they you know when they fill it all out they get to our landing page and i'm just going to new share i'm going to throw up the landing page here and show you what they see so when they fill in all the information, this is the landing page that they get to. They fill out this information. It you know, talks about our apprenticeship program, talks about a little bit of our branding, you know, and it gets down to at the bottom what our executives, people in the program have to say. So it really takes them through um, gives them professional, you know, we feel that, you know, one, the ad works well, we tweaked it, you know, there were some that we, you know, first few we tried, it was like, yeah, we're asking too much information, or we're giving them too much information, they wouldn't fill it in. And then we started with, you know, Jake's help, and our feedback, we really tweaked it, and really starting getting some really good response. And, and then so once they get to this scenario, uh, Bunny would reach out to them, and sort of do a conversation ideally is the first thing would be a conversation with them if not if it's just the text it's then okay you know where can we send you when can we do a presentation to you and then it got to the point where they she would start doing interviews or giving the information and getting some you know sometimes during that conversation well i'm, I'm four months out i'm six months out i'm only in the first so it was a matter of okay how do we allocate them into categories and do drip using the realty executives recruiting, you know, drip campaign is something that we implemented. And then depending where they were in their cycle, then they would, you know, she would put them into prime agent contacts and with the reminders is, hey, got to reach out to this person, got to reach out to this person. And then from that, then she would do her, her presentation 
which is So this is the presentation and maybe Bunny, as we go through this, you should just sort of, as you were, you know, talking with them, how you presented this. And I'll just sort of slide through here. Yeah, so um, we, I obviously talk a little bit about uh, Realty Executives and, you know, the history behind that and where we obviously were the US and Canada. Um, and then uh, I talk sort of more locally that this is where we are located. Uh, the one thing with those leads is, um, uh, geographically, I would get I would get a lot of people from Scarborough, or you get people from, you know, outside the city, um, which is fine. It's great to know that everybody's interested, but there we want people in the office, and if they're living in Scarborough, I don't know if they're willing to make the commute, but um, we're definitely open to it if they are. I'm happy to you know make things work for anybody. Um, but yeah, just sort of talk a little bit about the office. I do talk a lot about the fact that um, we are a team, but you're growing your own business, right? So I think it's really important for them to understand that just because it's a team, it doesn't mean you're growing somebody else's business, that you're working on your own, like your, your own business. But we work together as a team and support each other. And the reason we did that is we found that lots of new people coming into the industry are saying, well, you know, they're telling me I should be part of a team to get the experience. And, and our whole play on that is that's great. You want to be part of the team, but understanding that when you go to lead that team, you're taking no database. You're not taking any information. You are starting fresh. Yeah. And, and Bunny was really good at talking from that because she was on two top teams. Um, so that's one of the aspects of this is that we really want to and focus and really focus in on the realtor who wants to be make it a career and make their own business. So as I say, we're not we weren't hiring everybody we interviewed. Right. Uh, I explained to them that it is a one year commitment and that you know, they are expected to be in the office daily or as we've been doing during COVID, uh, we do Zoom calls every day. So they are expected to be on the Zoom calls every day. Uh, we do um, a lot of different types of training, um, the dialogue and the script, which is, you know, I always say to them, um, this stuff is really important because this is what helps give you the confidence uh, when you're out there and helps you look that much more professional. So you don't look like you're quite so green. Um, the seller buyer presentations, you know, once you get that appointment, now what are you going to say? So we work on building all that stuff. Um, role playing is a, is a big thing, obviously, that comes with the dialogue and the script training. And then we do uh, goal setting and tracking. So um, that's one of the first things we do when a new apprentice comes on is we do talk about goals. We stretch it out for the year and then I have them do the first quarter. Um, and then we revisit it close to the end of the first quarter to see, are they meeting those goals? And is that going to help them get to their end, year end goals? Um, yeah, so this just talks about, you know, what the mentor provides for them as far as, you know, the support, the coaching. Um, like I said, working on the goals, doing the training, motivating, advising, uh, you know, uh, celebrating their success and help give them directions. Um, also, uh, we are there as mentors to um, uh, any in-person appointments. Um, a lot of agents, I mean, it's the first time they're doing this, um, you know, they, uh, like a listing appointment. I would never expect them to go out on their own. For sure, I'd be going with them initially. Um, even sometimes showings, I have them shadow me on showings so that they get comfortable with how that process goes. Um, and I will com uh, make that comment now because... Uh, Scott said to make sure I let you guys know this. We also, you know, as I call them, we're going on a field trip. So um, I had one agent who uh, had been in the industry for a year and she'd never booked a showing. So that was like, okay. So I put her through the process. I want you to book the showings. And then we went out and we uh, did them together. And just so that she knew what to do because she had absolutely no idea. We had another agent who had a listing. So um, I had everybody in the group were going down to preview their listing uh, and go through the process and what we're going to do to get this uh, condo listed. So we do a lot of like hands-on stuff. 
I explained to them about uh, the, the CRM that uh, we have with Prime Agent and um, how, uh, you know, this Prime Agent CRM really does, as far as I'm concerned, stand out over others. Uh, it offers a lot as far as our drip campaign, marketing, the training. Um, it's, uh, yeah, but you guys all know that. So. And then the next one would be, I talk about uh, the DMX. Um, so that's one of the first things that um, we work on when they come is the DMX training to make sure they get that. I always talk about the fact we're in a digital marketing um, era and everybody needs to know what they need to do. I find that the DMX is a great tool to get them started because it, it gets them moving their database over right away. It gets them working with their database. And that's the first place they need to start is to, you know, um, work on the relationship with the people that they know. And it's mandatory. They have to do this. They have to do it. Yeah. Yep. And then I just sort of go through, uh, this is what we provide to them. So the business cards, the website, the team support and mentoring, the, the CRM and training. Um, we, uh, their leads, their for sold sign, they're for sold, they're sold and for sale signs uh, and the coaching. And I do like to point these things out that coaching and leads and the CRM and training, those things on their own can be like, if you're paying for those things on your own, that can be really expensive. So um, the fact that our program includes all these things is, is amazing. And that's the feedback you were getting during the interviews. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to leads, just to give you, we, we originally didn't have leads in there when we were getting, well, you know, there's other brokers that offer leads and there are lots. Uh, and that's why they say, well, they want to go to a team. So we implemented where we are using uh, Google ads. We have, um, um, we are using a supplier to get ads. Our budget for that is really around $500 a month, um, $500 to $750 a month. We're sort of using on online leads, Facebook leads. All the leads go to Bunny directly. She then assigns the leads and, and there's all kinds of follow-up that these agents must report back um, just as if they're part of a team. But the lead is theirs, it's not ours. So it is their lead. That's why we say when you finish this one year program through us, you actually are building your own database. You're not building a team leader database. And that was a huge difference, I think, Bunny, and during some of the interviews where they were going to join a team at Keller Williams or they were going to join a team somewhere else. This was, especially for the ones that we found that were motivated, self-driven, um, they weren't looking just for, they were glad that the leads were there, but that was something they said, that's great, but it wasn't like, that's the only reason. Yeah. Or we they, had they, some people, right? Yeah, these, uh, the, the, you know, the young ones, they wanna grow a business. They're looking to grow an empire, right? And I have to tell you that when you actually tell somebody about the whole team concept, there's a lot of the new agents who have no idea that if they left a brokerage or they left a team, sorry, that they'd have to leave anything, any business that they'd acquired while they were there. They, a lot of them have no idea that that's the situation. So um, no, yeah, it was good to tell them. So our compensation program for them is they're on a 50-50 commission split, no monthly fee. So included in their program is the Realty Executives International Fee, Realty, you know, Realty Executives Regional Fee, the prime agent upgrade, so I think, you know, 10 bucks US a month, a website. We do give them a couple choices on website. Uh, I know Alicia would love us to push the uh, Realty Executives International website, but in the GTA, well, there's one company, Alicia, that I showed you and, and Dave, the last time you are here, Incom, that one thing that everybody likes about theirs, it also has all the pre-construction in it as well. Which you know, uh, which is a big hot item in the GTA. If you you know, how do we get involved with pre-construction? So lots of you know, gone that route. Some have done the realty executives, but um, so we include the website. We include signs for them. Basically, our signs are generic signs with a sign writer with their name. So the call does go directly to them, but it makes it easy to have a generic sign with a sign writer. And then we give them cards. 
They are responsible though for their own board fees. They're responsible for their own RICO fees. And if they want to do additional marketing, that's at their cost. So they're 50-50 to a gross of 60,000. Then they go to 95.5 for closings that year. Out of the 30,000 that we get, 50% goes back to the brokerage to cover off the expenses and 50% goes to the mentor, to the, okay? These are some of the people that have gone through. So in our presentation, we have some of, um, some of the testimonials. And interestingly enough, Lena came to us from, you know, she was, you know, it was during COVID, but still, you know, all the things that Realty Executives International did for us during COVID with, you know, really implementing the different DMX programs and stuff. She was with Royal LePage, a strong Royal LePage office and had no interaction at all. It was, that was really a shame. Tra training for her was go online, click on and go through it. So she joined us from Royal LePage and has done you know, very well. Uh, background is an engineer. So uh, Lorena was actually part of a team within our brokerage. Then that person then decided that they were just going to stick. They were going to downsize their team, uh, recommended Lorena come to us. And she has soared. She has just been, you know, the confidence level in her has yeah. totally changed. Yeah. Um, really changed to the now to the point where she's saying, well, I, you know, if I, I'm looking at, you know, down the road, building my own team, can you help me with that? So we have found that, you know, this program has certainly gained traction and has definitely, you know, tweaked the industry a little bit just by using the word apprentice, but really designing it that there's a commitment level there and it's not just for everybody. So I wanted to introduce that to you. I want to, you know, there may be an opportunity that in your, in your territory, you might, you know, might be able to implement it in some way. Um, maybe there is somebody who is in your brokerage that would want to be a mentor in this kind of, you know, facilitate this kind of uh, avenue. Um, I can certainly help with, you know, between Jake and myself, um, and Bunny, we can help support you in any way that you want. Um, but I wanted to introduce you and let you know what kind of success we've been having with it here as a pilot project. I, I needed to try it to really get a feedback on what the realtors are saying, how the program would roll out. Um, comments, thoughts? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, with the leads that were coming in, like for you guys to interview, um, were you were you trying to direct them to your custom page on uh, RealtyExecutivesPlus.ca, or were you capturing that lead information on Facebook, or both? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can actually say that that the the landing page when they filled in the information. And Jake, are you there? Maybe yeah, Mike. Maybe he's yeah you, yeah. Can, I'm yeah. here. Sorry, I was just on mute. Yeah, can you sort of walk through sort of how you how it works? Uh, how the ads work? Yeah, so if, if someone sees the ad and then they click on and we're asking them for information, where is that? How is how are we getting their information? I guess is Alicia really wants to try and find out. Yeah, whether you're using uh, the Facebook form or whether you're directing them to the Realty Executives um, Apprentice page that you built. We use the Facebook form and we just uh, simplified it. Like like Scott mentioned at the beginning, we were asking a bunch of questions, but we noticed that it wasn't really getting that much engagement. So we just kept it really simple. Um, we just wanted to know if they were uh, enrolled in any courses or if they were trying to pursue their real estate career. And uh, that's basically the only two questions that we asked, their name and email. Um, and their number, we just made it optional. And after that, um, they would submit the information to Facebook and then we gave them the option to go on to the landing page that Scott showed uh, for them to see all the, like what is Realty Executives Plus about and, and stuff like that. Gotcha, okay, that makes sense, thank you. No problem. Um, thoughts, something that any of you want to look at further, see if I can help in the area where you are. 
I would, Scott, I'd say, you know, uh, through COVID, we've kind of taken a, a back seat to recruiting. But I think as we're coming out of it, uh, it's time to, to get, really get back on the horse and, and uh, try to pursue it. I mean, um, you know, the, the true performers through COVID shine through. And those who saw this uh, as an easy way to make money realized very quickly it wasn't that way. And they do need the mentoring. They do need the support. Um, but I think we got to corral some of them, even our own existing people, back into the fold and, uh, and reach out. I mean, I have a bunch of extra space here now. And uh, I'd like to, you know, sort of maybe talk it up with you or some of the others. But, you know, I'm willing to give a private a very large private office to a small team at no cost, suck up some fees for the balance of the year, or maybe even a little longer to get them on board. But that, that's open for another discussion. And this might fit into that as well. But, but I don't know if, if anybody's had any luck dragging, a, I hate to use the term dragging, but bringing a team in. Yeah, and, and this is where the idea of the apprenticeship um, sort of we were trying to attract people that were, you know, the whole goal for me was get them in, train them properly, get them to understand the culture of our brokerage and realty executives. And then next year they become a full fledged agent within our organization. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Um, giving them the option that if they wanted to stay in the mentorship, the apprenticeship program, they could, yeah. but then they could switch over to a, regular executive program okay okay i'm a little off topic but i have one question for alicia yep. and i'm sure scott you can jump in but last we were i think in arizona it seemed like the direction was team 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 and is that still the case i would say throughout the network um yes where i was where i've seen the most um let's call it let's significant growth in a really short period of time. It's not broker owners who are going out and recruiting one person at a time, although of course that is still happening. It's the brokers that are going out and they're recruiting teams because then they're instantly adding 10 people, five people, um, things like that. And so there's been like a handful of, I would say success stories in the network who have been very good at grabbing up those teams. Um, one thing that I will say, though, that I've noticed it's kind of the common thread among the ones that are having a lot of success with that, they already have a decent amount of size when they start getting really good at attracting teams. So they're generally not like people who start with 10 people and then they add a team of 10. Like it's someone who might have 50 people and they add a, a team of 10. It's 100 people and they add it, you know. Okay. So it's that, you know, I don't know if that's just an optics thing for the teams wanting to be part of something bigger. Um, or if it's just practice because they've had so much like recruiting time in front of different people, solo agents and teams. But um, we do see we do see a lot of success in terms of growth by bringing on chunks of people at a time versus the, the single agent. That being said, though, um, even like for us, like as a network, right, like we're not 100,000 people. And so everything counts and everything matters. And so if you are starting from a smaller brokerage, even adding two people or three people can really, really move the needle. So even though we do see teams, it might not make sense for you. And I don't, you know, we would never want to push that on someone. Um, it's just more about what structure works best for your brokerage and where you would like to be. But I do think it gets easier as you get a little more size to your brokerage. Thanks. I'm sorry, Scott, to sort of divert a bit there. No, that actually you, you went into my next thing. It says open discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so... But yeah, if any of you individually want to reach out to me, if you think the apprenticeship program um, or some derivative of it, would you be interested in that? You know, I'm here to help. And that's why I wanted to go through the, the project first, because um, I had to go through the steps to really sort of, you know, figure out what works, what didn't, and then how that could be implemented. So yeah. Scott, Mike here. Yeah, Mike. I have a question for you. Um, first of all, I know we talked about it late fall and you told me you're working on something. So it's nice to see that it's come full circle. I think it's, uh, uh, extremely well done. Um, from our standpoint up here, uh, I think it's extremely well done. So 
uh, congrats on that. One thing is, if I was, you know, as an example of a broker owner, um, I did talk to one realtor about that. So would I be able to have that one realtor at mentorship before I would implement that program from you, from your office, just so he knows the program? You know what I mean? Oh, I see. So if you had somebody that you want us to train as being being the bunny, being being the mentor. Correct. Absolutely. Not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I did, you know, I just volunteered bunny's time and my time, <laughs> bunny's time, but she is she's well, wonderful. She is uh, um, right. yeah, she I actually I, I put together a complete uh, I was putting together a, a whole overview of who the person had to be, what they had to be like, what they had to do. And I kept going, I kept coming back and going, bunny, bunny, bunny's in your office. She's done all this. She's, you know, so absolutely anybody yeah. that you want to go through the program with us, not a problem. I'm, a, I'm always happy to help. Obviously, whatever uh, I can do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And obviously I wouldn't ask for it for free, Scott. I know that's, uh, you know, that's time and effort and there's, there's some valuable information there. So. Uh, obviously that's something we talked about, but I was just wondering if that was available. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything to help, you know, anything to help, you know, people grow their business. Right. So that, that's why, that's why we needed to go through that, uh, you know, the, the trial to figure out, you know, now we've got some answers. We've got, you know, the friends, you know, as Jake was saying, you know, we ran some ads the first time and we were, we were like asking questions like crazy. It was like, why is nobody responding? <laughs> <laughs> so we made it simple and we started getting some really good inquiries. So, and we still have a pipeline, right? Funny, we still have a pipeline of people that we're going through. Um, we had to turn it off because yeah. there was, there was too many, like it was, you know, we kind of hit what we wanted our goal for this year. So, um, but now I'm going back to it to get ready, ramped up for next year. But yeah, yeah. there's a huge pipeline. So we're going to reactivate it again and, and then start that flow of leads. Yeah. Follow up. So you mentioned that, that the goal for the second iteration of this is probably 10 executives to go through the program. Yes. Um, scale wise, is that kind of where you're thinking the sweet spot is 10, 10 people per coach or how do you see this look growing in the future on that end? And in, in the, yeah, what we see is because it's so hands-on, and with when and this is just because I have you know Bunny doing this now. Bunny can be you know she's 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 super she's there she's attentive, but you, you also want to keep it small enough that there's an interaction so it doesn't become a classroom. Yeah. So what and, and that's why the first year we said five. And we found that sort of to be the number because the way the program works is really front end loaded with lots of in class per se, and lots of tasks that you have to get going in. And then once you've got them through all their dialogue, through all the presentations, through their, you know, the, the cycle of getting them to understand the, a weekly daily flow of what business is, then they get into a habit. So you can let the reins off a little bit, but you can jump in any time, but you can let the reins off a little bit and then bring a new group in to start them at this level. They don't start them at A again, yet the other ones are already down to G, H going through the process. Yeah. So that's but why still we still coming in and yeah. being part of the, the yeah. daily routine. Yeah, but that's why we see sort of next year and that's why we say 10 because I think you can do it in groups of five and five or trend, you know, and so there's a little bit of an overlap, but if you tried to take 10 brand new through the same process, it becomes not as exclusive, not as apprenticeship style. I would be worried that I'm not giving them the attention that they need. And that, to me, that's important. I want the, everybody to feel that they can come to me when they have something. I wanna make sure that I'm available. So um, by doing it sort of like Scott was saying, sort of five and five, um, then at least I know that I can be there if somebody needs me. Yeah, and, and if I have ten agents who need me to go to listing appointments, or you know, it, it makes it tough for me to work on my business. Well, and that's what's happening is what, what takes place is you get with five, then you got okay. You know what? There's a listing presentation. We go to that listing presentation. 
then the ones that get trained are okay doing their own listing presentation, but they still need the mentorship. They still need the accountability. Then you can bring the other ones through the start program again. So there's a little bit of an overlap. And the other th reason we put a number on it is because then it is exactly what we say it is. We are hiring, we have space for five apprentices this year. We have space for 10 apprentices next year. That's it. Yeah, gives it a little bit of a sense of urgency too when it's limited seats. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say on one of the in, the, in the first contract, so basically it's a regular contract with a Schedule A. Um, and in the Schedule A, it just talks about everything that we're supplying them. And in the first one I, I built out, my whole idea was to make this a value in the event that they leave the first year, within that first year, um, all the transactions that they, st they still get paid out, but they also owe the company $2,500 for leaving early. I took that line out initially because we were getting a little bit of feed, a little bit of pushback because we really didn't have anything to show success yet. But next year, the contract's going to have, there will be, a, you know, you, well, you leave, it's a one-year contract, but you know, all your deals would be paid out 50-50 no matter where your program is, plus there's a $2,500 exit cost. So they see that there is, okay, you know what, I got to be committed to this. So they have a bit of skin in the game, so to speak. But that was hard to sell that without having the testimonials and the production of the agents that went through the, the, the period already. But we're at that point now where we can show, hey, people are in this program, here's their testimonials, here's the deals they're doing, here's you know what they've been able to do and so now we can add value to that and show that there's a value add to this. Yeah. Thoughts, questions, open discussions. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, was this time valuable? Did you get, hopefully you got something out of it. It's great to see everybody and looking forward to traveling around and seeing everybody in person. It was great information, Scott. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. That was excellent. That was fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing that. Okay, well, if there's any other questions before we sign off? No? Um, yeah, Jake. I'm not sure if he's... Oh, oh, sorry, I, I didn't have any questions. I was just sending a reaction. All right. Hey, like thank an you, applause for your thumbs up. Appreciate crazy. that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, will, I will send out the unique selling proposition to everybody. So you'll have that. Start working on that. Um, and if you want to you know, reach out to me on any of the other points individually, please do. Um, and you want to talk about you know, the implementation of the apprenticeship format or some kind of format of it in your area. You know, when we go through your, um, you know, your unique selling proposition, we can add that to it too, because I think this ties into something that could be a differentiator for you, at least starting to get, you know, something that's different. So, and Alicia, again, I want to thank you for all the time and you're putting in to this and, and the rest of the team at International. Greatly appreciate all the support and all the stuff. And I look forward to the franchise training and the unconvention convention. So um, thank you, everybody. Appreciate the time and we'll be in touch. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.